revenue recognition affects all of us, even Johnny. Well, it doesn't really, since he's still in high school, but let's follow him in this scenario. Johnny noticed that all his friends were stressed about learning the five steps of revenue recognition. But why? Let's see what happened yesterday in Mr. Harrison's accounting class. This is the poorest class I've had in a long, long time. Most of you have no foundation at all. Now, the trouble's with your attitude. You don't pay enough attention in class. You don't now, hold on just a minute, Mr. Harrison. If they apply themselves, there's still time to learn the steps before the exam. What's wrong, Johnny? I'm really having trouble understanding revenue recognition. Everyone is. So what's the big deal? Mr. Harrison said if I fail my exam, I won't be able to go to the school mixer on Friday. Oh no, you promised to take me. Gee whiz, I know, but I don't even know where to start. Well, I can help. First, you have to identify the contract. Okay, a contract is an agreement between parties which creates enforceable rights and obligations. See, you do know what you're doing. But Sally, there's more to it than that. Johnny's right. It's in the details where things can get tricky. But what can he do? Why don't you go see the school guidance counselor? Maybe he can help. That's a swell idea, Sally. The guidance counselor will certainly understand complex gap. Mr. Petey, I get the basics, but what happens if there's a modification to the contract? Well, if both the scope, that is what you're doing, and the price go up accordingly, then it will be a separate contract. But what if it's not a separate contract? If it doesn't qualify as a separate contract, then it could be a new contract, a simple modification of the existing contract, or some combination. And that would have an impact on the timing of the revenue recognition. Good, Johnny. Now, how about probable collection? I do know that without probable collection, there is no contract. That's right. But what does that mean? I tried to ask Betty about that yesterday, but she got all upset. And Joey just thought the whole thing was a joke. Well, the most important thing is to not confuse it with bad debt. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Petey. I just need to collect your trash. It's okay. We were just discussing probable collection. Well, probable collection means that the customer has the intention and ability to pay. That would make it much easier to have a contract. Uh, you going to finish that sandwich, Mr. Petey? It seems Johnny is off to a great start. But he has four more steps to learn before he can even think about going to the school mixer. Later, in English class, Johnny had a nice surprise. Today, we're going to learn how to identify the separate performance obligations. Why is she teaching this in English? I don't know. Did you hear about Marilyn? Ladies. Let's see if Miss Tidy can give some insight. Now, class, some of you know that you must separate the separate performance obligations when they exist in a contract. What about shipping and handling costs? Good question, Johnny. If these occur before the customer obtains control, they are not a promised service. So those would not be separated? That's right. They would get bottled in with the related item. So how do you think we should handle those costs if they occur after the customer obtains control? Mildred? Well, I'm not taking accounting class. I, I don't know. It looks like Johnny knows. Yes, Johnny? If they occur after the customer obtains control, then you can elect to treat them as an activity to fulfill the promise rather than a separate service. Yes. With a little more help, it looks like Johnny 
and Sally might just make it to the mixer Friday night. At lunch, Johnny decided to discuss how to determine the transaction price with his friends. I don't see what the big deal is, Johnny. Why don't you just look at the price on the box? You see, when determining the transaction price, you have to take into consideration many types of variable compensation. Well, like what? For instance, what if the item is on sale or something? Gee whiz, I never thought of that. Then the transaction price would be lower than the price on the box. My, don't I feel like a dope. It looks like Johnny and his friends are starting to catch on. Say, what if it wasn't on sale, but you had a swell coupon or something? That's known as consideration paid to the customer and would also reduce the price. But why? The price is still the same, but you just got a little break, right? No, not really. I get it. The store was never entitled to the full price because they gave the customer the coupon. That makes sense. Gee, now I feel like a dope. Don't be so hard on yourself, Stu. This is a tough topic. I think we can assume that anything that ultimately lowers the price that we are aware of will reduce the transaction price. Way to go, Johnny. You'd better ask Dad if you can borrow the car to take Sally to the mixer. Johnny was beginning to feel pretty good until he realized he would have to allocate the transaction price to the separate performance obligations. Gee, Johnny, looks like you'd simply look at what folks normally sell the items for. That's known as the standalone selling price, Darren. So, problem solved, right? Well, what if there's a discount or something? Which obligation price do you reduce? Well, gee, I never thought about that. Well, I suppose you would normally allocate that proportionately, assuming the discount was for the group of items. Yes, sure. But I suppose it could be allocated to one specific item if there was evidence to support it. To allocate the discount to a single item, wouldn't that item have to be sold regularly on a standalone basis? Say, I think Sally's got a point. Like, wow, Sally, you've got it. And I think we're going to that mixer. After school, the kids needed a break from their revenue recognition problems. So they decided to swing by the malt shop. Well, gang, only one more step and we've got this beat. We simply recognize revenue as the obligations are satisfied. I don't know, Johnny. It can't possibly be that simple. Golly gee, Heidi always has the coolest fashion sense. I wonder where she finds such keen clothes. I heard she always buys from stores with good return policies. That way she can return it if she doesn't like it. Say, that would affect revenue recognition. How? Well, if the store has an obligation to take back the clothes and issue a refund, then I suppose they wouldn't really have a sale until the return time was up. Neato, Johnny. You're right. And so they couldn't recognize the revenue until the time had passed. But how would the store account for the money it collected up front? Well, gee, I guess it would be a liability of some sort. That's it, Johnny. We are going to the mixer. As you might have guessed, Johnny did just fine on his accounting exam, and he did take Sally to the school mixer. I hope that you, like Johnny, have come to understand that revenue recognition is really a snap once you understand the five steps and their particular details. And if you need a little extra help, you can always swipe a copy of the standard directly from the FASB.